I did have a really strong vision of what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And it's really strange because when I was eight years old, about eight years old, I thought, yes, I want to be a poet. I want it to be political, but I want it to be funny and I want to put my poetry into plays and I want to put my poetry into music and, you know, I want to be on telly with Yvonne Ridley and things like this, you know. And, um, and then in my teenage years, I lost the dream because the stereotype of a young black man is to be a car mechanic or a paint and decorator or something like this. And then I went through a stage where I got in trouble with the police and went to prison. But then, after that, I said, I'm going to go back to that dream I had when I was eight years old and that's what I'm doing now. So, in a way, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but people around me were telling me that it was an impossible dream. I mean, you, you are a role model, not just for, for black kids in, in Britain, but kids right across the world who have these sort of dreams. But uh, you also were battling against uh, dyslexia. Was it diagnosed or was it only later years that you realised? Oh, no diagnosis at all. In those days, it wasn't recognised in schools at all. So I was just, um, some. if they wanted to put it kindly, they would say simple. Or if they wanted to put it harshly, they would say dunce. Um, it was only later on in life when I learned how to read and write that I realised that I was dyslexic. Um, and that's word blindness, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in Britain, something like 70% of architects are dyslexic. But I'll tell you something else, 70% of people in prison are dyslexic as well. So it shows you, you can go one way or the other. You seem to know a lot about the statistics. Are you part of a dyslexia charity or patron of a, an organisation? I'm patron of three dyslexia organisations and I've just picked up an award for achievement in dyslexia from an organisation called Dyslexia Action. But, you know, and you accepted the award? I accepted that award, yeah, because it comes from good people for a good reason. Well, don't say that. I mean, you you refused the OBE when you were offered that. That's a bad award for bad reasons. Um, I don't want government-sponsored poetry and I don't want to write government-sponsored poetry and I don't need Tony Blair or Her Majesty the Queen to kind of give my poetry the stamp of approval. I want normal everyday people to get turned on by my poetry and uh, I want to change the world. I want to cause a revolution. I don't want to kind of become part of the problem and just become an establishment in that sense. Can you give a, a message um, to our viewers now? We've got uh, 2010 just around the corner. Um, what would you want to make for your New Year resolution? <laughs> Gosh, I don't normally do New Year's resolution um, resolutions, but um, I would want to remind or tell people who don't know, people with power and everyday people, that there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. For all you English speakers out there, make peace a verb, a doing word do peace. You've got to go out there actively and make peace. It's like a marriage. You can't just get up and say, I'm married, and then just act like you're single. You've got to work at it. And so it is with peace. We've really got to work at it. Because the human race has achieved many things, gone to the moon, done all kinds of things, invent this, that and the other. Come on, we can do peace. Uh, and I think as soon as we start thinking it as something we can do, a doing, a verb, then uh, we can make peace. So, so where have you been, anyway? Well, I told you I was uh, going to Gaza. In fact, I tried to get into Gaza with the American Code Pink people. More than a thousand of us were at the Rafa border at around the same time that George Galloway's Viva Palestina convoy rolled up. They were also trying to break the siege. And what happened? Well, here's a clue. As you can see, I didn't get to Gaza. In fact, the truth is, I never got out of Cairo. This is about as far as my journey went. My bags are packed. I'm heading back to London. The good news is, I did meet some incredible people. We did some interviews, and here are a few for your enjoyment. Well, it's amazing who you bump into on your travels, and um, I've bumped into an old friend. Rabbi Cohen from Manchester. What on earth are you doing in Cairo? 
come to show support for the Palestinians in Gaza and to show that people should understand that Judaism and Zionism are two different concepts. What you see in Israel is a distortion of Judaism. It's not Judaism at all. It's a blot on the name of Judaism. And there should, if there hadn't been the whole concept of Zionism, we would have no problem in Gaza or anywhere in Palestine. Well, if uh, proof were needed that not all Jews are Zionists and not all Zionists are Jews, certainly Rabbi Cohen is an example of that. How long are you prepared to stay in Cairo? Well, we, we came with the idea of going to Gaza. Some of my friends, Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Feldman from the United States, are in Arish, in El Arish at the moment. They thought that they would uh, be there. Uh, in fact, they, they, they feel a bit out of, out of things now because everybody's here in Cairo. But we're planning I, my flight to back to the United Kingdom this next Sunday. Uh, so I'm prepared to stay till Sunday. Every single person who makes a choice to be here is an inspiration. Every single person. Now we've got Rabbi Aaron Cohen behind yes. us from Manchester. Yes. Um, I suppose he visually anyway fits the stereotype of a rabbi. If you're into stereotypes. If you're into stereotypes.